What's going on everybody? Welcome back to another Tesla video. So yesterday Tesla hosted the Autonomous Day Conference. Uh, the people in attendance also got to uh, test ride in the newest full self-driving and uh, you can see here it does turns and everything on regular streets. Uh, the actual event was over two and a half hours long and I did my best to condense it down under 20 minutes for you guys. So if you're in a rush or you just want to see like uh, the important stuff, you know, this video is for you. So it's under 20 minutes long. Uh, it was really difficult to condense it down to under 20 minutes because there's so much good content. So if you guys have the time, definitely do recommend sit down, watch the whole entire thing from start to finish. Uh, the best way to explain it, it's like watching uh, three TED Talks with question and answers and everything. It's, like I said, a really good watch. So I'm going to cut out my voice in just a moment so you guys can uh, hear the conference and all the pieces that I cut. And uh, hopefully you guys enjoy this. Make sure you are subscribed for more Tesla content. Uh, like the video and leave a comment on what you guys think. Uh, on the event and Tesla autonomy and all that good stuff. So uh, most importantly, guys, thanks for watching and I will see you guys next time. Um, I was hired in February of 2016. I asked Elon if he was willing to spend all the money it takes to do full custom system design. And he said, well, uh, are we gonna win? And I said, well, yeah, of course. So he said, I'm in. And uh, so that got us started. We hired a bunch of people and, and started thinking about what a, full, uh, what a custom design chip for full autonomy would look like. We spent 18 months uh, doing the design, and in August of 2017, we released the design for manufacturing. We got it back in December, it powered up, and it actually worked very, very well on the first try. We made a few changes and released a B0 rev in April of 2018. In July of uh, 2018, uh, the chip was qualified, and we started uh, full production of uh, production quality parts. In December of 2018, we had the autonomous driving stack running on the new hardware and we were able to start uh, retrofitting employee cars and testing the hardware and software out in the real world. Uh, just last March, we started shipping uh, the new computer in the Model S and X, and just earlier in April, we started production in the Model 3. So th this whole program from the hiring of the first few employees to having it in full production in all three of our cars is just a little over three years. And here's what it looks like. Uh, over there on the right, you see all the connectors for the video that comes in from our, the eight cameras that are in the car. You can see the two self-driving computers in the middle of the board, and then on the left is the power supply and some control connections. And so I really love it when a solution is boiled down to its barest elements. You have video, computing, and power, and, and uh, it's uh, straightforward and simple. Here's the original hardware 2.5 enclosure that the computer went into and we've been shipping for the last two years. Here's the new design for the FSD computer. It's basically the same, and that, of course, is driven by the constraints of having a retrofit program for the cars. Um, I'd like to point out that this is actually a pretty small computer. It fits behind the glove box, between the glove box and the firewall in the car. It does not take up half your trunk. As I said earlier, there's two fully independent computers on the board. Uh, you can see them there highlighted in blue and green. Any part of this could fail, and the car will keep driving. So you could have cameras fail, you could have uh, power circuits fail, you could have one of the Tesla full, full self-driving computer chips fail, the car keeps driving. Uh, the probability of, the, of this computer failing is substantially lower than somebody losing consciousness. That, that's the key metric, at least in order of magnitude. So uh, throughout this talk, I'm going to talk about a neural network uh, from our narrow camera. It uses 35, giga, 35 billion operations, 35 giga ops. And if we used all 12 CPUs uh, to process that network, we could do one and a half frames per second, which is super slow, not nearly adequate to drive the car. If we use the 600 gigaflop GPU, uh, the same network, we'd get 17 frames per second, which is still not good enough to drive the car with eight cameras. The neural network accelerators on the chip can deliver 2,100 frames per second. And you can see from the scaling as we moved along that the amount of computing in the CPU and GPU are basically insignificant to what's available in the neural network accelerator. It, we had a goal to stay under 100 watts. This is measured data from cars driving around running the full autopilot stack. And we're dissipating 72 watts, which is a little bit more power than the previous design, but with the dramatic improvement in performance, it's still a pretty good answer. 
Um, of that 72 watts, about 15 watts is, is being consumed running the neural networks. In terms of cost, the silicon cost of this solution is about 80% of what we were paying before. So we are saving money by uh, switching to this solution. And in terms of performance, we took the narrow camera uh, neural network, which I've been talking about, that has 35 billion operations in it. We ran it on the old hardware as, uh, in a loop as quick as possible, and we delivered 110 frames per second. We took the same data, the same network, uh, compiled it for hardware for the new FSD computer, uh, and using all four accelerators, we can get 2,300 frames per second processed. So a factor of 21. I think this, this is perhaps the most significant slide. It's night and day. All cars being produced have, the, have all the hardware necessary, compute and otherwise, for full self-driving. LiDAR is, is a fool's errand. And, any, and anyone relying on LiDAR is doomed. <laughs> doomed. Expensive, expensive sensors that are, are unnecessary. I think if, if somebody started today and they were really good, they might have something like what we have right now in three years. Um, at, but in two years, we'll have something, something three times better. That's, I think, a very powerful sustainable advantage for us is the fleet. Nobody has the fleet. Those weights are constantly being updated and improved uh, based on billions of miles driven. Um, Tesla has a hundred times more cars with uh, the full self-driving hardware than anyone, everyone else combined. What we are seeing here is a stream of videos from across the vehicle, across the car. These are eight cameras that uh, send us videos and then these neural networks are looking at those videos and are processing them and making predictions about what they're seeing. And so the, some of the things that we're interested in and some of the things you're seeing on this visualization here are lane line markings, other objects, the distances to those objects, what we call drivable space, shown in blue, which is where the car is allowed to go, and a lot of other predictions like traffic lights, traffic signs, and so on, uh, lead like this. And we're interested in, for example, lane line markings. So we, a human typically goes into an image and using a mouse annotates the lane line markings. So here's an example of an annotation that a human could create a label for this image. Exactly different example. For example, here is an image that actually the road, the road is curving and it is a bit of a more residential neighborhood. Then if you show the neural network this image, that network might make a prediction that is incorrect. It might say that, okay, well, I've seen lots of times on highways, lanes just go forward, so here's a possible prediction. <coughs> and of course, this is very incorrect. Feed lots of images of this to the neural net. And neural net over time will accumulate, will basically pick up on this pattern that those things there don't matter but those lane line markings do, and we learn to predict the correct uh, lane. To get neural networks to work well, you require these three essentials. You require a large data set, a varied data set, and a real data set. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you're driving down the highway, someone is on the left or on the right, and they cut in in front of you into your lane. So here's a video showing the autopilot detecting that this car uh, is intruding into our lane. Now, of course, we'd like to detect a cut in as fast as possible. So the way we approach this problem is we don't write explicit uh, code for is the left blinker on, is the right blinker on, track the cuboid over time and see if it's moving horizontally. We actually use a fleet learning approach. So the way this works is we ask the fleet to please send us data whenever they see a car transition from a right lane to the center lane or from left to center. And then what we do is we rewind time backwards and we automatically can annotate that, hey, that car will turn, will in 1.3 seconds cut in in front, of the, in front of you. And then we can use that for training the neural net. So what you're seeing here is a video and we are overlaying the, pr the predictions of the network. So this is a path that the network would follow um, in green. And some, yeah. I mean, the crazy thing is the network is predicting paths it can't even see with incredibly high accuracy. And LiDAR gives you these point measurements of distance around you. Um, now, one, th one thing I'd like to point out, first of all, is you all came here, you drove here, many of you, and you used your, <laughs> your uh, neural net and vision. You were not shooting lasers out of your eyes. So in circles, I'm showing radar objects, and, in, uh, and the cuboids that are coming out uh, here are purely from vision. So the cuboids here are just coming out of vision, and the depth of those cuboids is learned by a sensor annotation from the radar. So if this is working very well, then you would see that the circles in the top-down view would agree with the cuboids, and they do. And that's because neural networks are very competent at predicting depths. 
the entire uh, infrastructure that we have built up for roads is all designed for human visual consumption. So all of the signs, all of the traffic lights, everything is designed for vision. And so that's where all that information is, and so you need that ability. Is that person distracted and on their phone? Are they going to walk, walk into your lane? Those answers to all these questions are only found in vision and are necessary for level four, level five autonomy. I don't actually super hate LiDAR as much as it may sound, um, but at SpaceX, uh, SpaceX Dragon uses LiDAR to navigate to the space station and dock. Not only that, we, the, SpaceX developed its own LiDAR from scratch to do that, and I spearheaded that effort personally, because in that scenario, LiDAR makes sense, and in cars, it's friggin' stupid. It's expensive and unnecessary, and as Andre was saying, once you solve vision, it, it's, it's worthless. So you have expensive hardware that's worthless on the car. The, we do have a forward radar, which, which is low cost and is helpful, especially for occlusion situations. So if there's like fog or dust or, or you know, snow, the radar can see through that. Uh, so like I mentioned, um, we have a very sophisticated trigger infrastructure. If you have intervened, it's actually potentially likely that we receive that clip and that we can actually analyze it and see what happened and, and tune the system. So it probably enters some statistics over, okay, at what rate are we, uh, are we correctly merging the traffic? And we look at those numbers and we look at the clips and we see what's wrong and we try to fix those clips and make progress against those benchmarks. So we're at seven, 70 million miles already for Navigate on Autopilot. It's something really, really, really cool. And I think one thing that is worth kind of calling out on this is that we're continuing to accelerate and keep learning from this data. Like Andre talked about this data engine. As this accelerates up, we actually do make more and more assertive lane changes. We are learning from these cases where people intervene. Here, we have eight cameras, but then we also have additionally 12 ultrasonic sensors, a radar, an inertial measurement unit, GPS. And then one thing we forget about is we also have the pedal and steering actions. So not only can we look at what's happening around the vehicle, we can look at how humans chose to interact with that environment. And so I'll talk through this clip right now. This basically is showing what's happening today in the car, and we're continuing to push this forward. So we start with a single neural network. We see the detections around it. We then build all that together with multiple neural networks and multiple detections. We bring in the other sensors, and we convert that into what Elon calls a vector space, an understanding of the world around us. And this is something where, as we continue to get better and better at this, we're moving more and more of this logic into the neural networks themselves. So we have a neural network running on our, say, wide fisheye camera. That neural network is not making one prediction about the world. It's making many separate predictions some of which actually audit each other. So as a real example, we have the ability to detect a pedestrian. That's something we train very, very carefully on and put a lot of work into. But we also have the ability to detect obstacles in the roadway, and a pedestrian is an obstacle. And it's shown differently to the neural network. It says, oh, there's a thing I can't drive through. And these together combine to give us an increased sense of what we can and can't do in front of the vehicle and how to plan for that. We then do this across multiple cameras because we have overlapping fields of view in many places around the vehicle. In front, we have a particularly large number of overlapping fields of view. Lastly, we can combine that with things like the radar and the ultrasonics to build these extremely precise understandings of what's happening in front of the car. We can use that both to learn future behaviors that are very accurate, but we can also build very accurate predictions of how things will continue to happen in front of us. So one example I think is really exciting is we can actually look at bicyclists and people and not just ask, where are you now, but where are you going? Start, we actually asked everybody to confirm the car's behavior via stock confirm. And so we started making lots and lots of predictions about how we should be navigating the highway. We asked people to tell us, is this right or is this wrong? And this is, again, a chance to churn that data engine. And we did spot some really tricky and interesting long tails of, in this case, I think a really fun example, like the, these very interesting cases of simultaneous merging where you start going and then somebody moves either behind or before you, not noticing you. And what is the appropriate behavior here? And what are the tunings of the neural network we need to do to be super precise about the appropriate behaviors here? We worked, we tuned these in the background, we made them better. And over the course of time, we got nine million successfully accepted lane changes. So we've gone through the future of self-driving, um, where it's, it's, it's hardware, it's vision, and then there's a lot of software and there's a, the, the software problem here should not be minimized. It's a, it's a massive software problem uh, that, that uh, yeah, managing vast amounts of data, training against the data, uh, how do you control the car based on the vision? It's a very difficult software problem. You know, way back when we created the company, we said we'd build Tesla Roadster. They said it was impossible. 
and that, and that even if we did build it, nobody would buy it. Um, the, this was like universal opinion was that building an electric car was extremely dumb and would fail. Then, then so we would build a more affordable car with the, the Model S. We did that. Um, again, we were told that's impossible. Um, I was called a fraud and a liar. And it was not going to happen. This is all untrue. Okay, famous last words. Now, is we, we, we went to production with the Model S in 2012. Uh, it exceeded all expectations. There is still, in 2019, no car that can compete with the Model S of 2012. It's seven years later. Still waiting. <laughs> uh, so we'd build a, 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 um, a, an affordable car, maybe highly affordable, it's affordable, more affordable, uh, with, with the Model 3. We built the Model 3, we're in production. Um, I said we'd get over 5,000 cars a week for Model 3. Uh, at this point, 5,000 cars a week is, is a walk in the park for us. It's not even hard. So we'd do it, we did it. We're going to do the robo taxi thing too. Only criticism, and it's a fair one, and sometimes I'm not on time. <laughs> but I get it done, and the Tesla team gets it done. So what we're going to do this year uh, is we're going to reach uh, combined production of 10,000 a week between SX and 3. Feel very confident about that. Uh, and we feel very confident about being feature complete with self-driving. Um, Next year, we'll expand the product line with Model Y and Semi, uh, and we expect to have the first operating robo-taxis next year, with no one in them next year. Not in all, jurisdic not in all jurisdictions, because we won't have regulatory approval everywhere, but I, I, I'm confident we'll have at least regulatory approval somewhere literally next year. Um, so any customer will be able to add or remove their car to the Tesla network. So we expect this to operate, um, it's, similar, it's sort of a, like a combination of maybe the Uber and Airbnb model. So if you own the car, you can add or subtract it to the Tesla network, and Tesla would uh, take uh, 25 or 30% of the revenue. Um, and, uh, and then in places where there aren't enough people sharing their cars, we would just have dedicated uh, Tesla vehicles. Um, so we'll sh we'll sh when you use the car, we'll show you our ride-sharing app. So you're able to, you're able to summon the car from the parking lot, get in, and go for a drive. So you say, what would be the probable gross profit from a single robo-taxi? Um, we think probably something on the order of $30,000 per year. Any, any kind of known situation with, with Vision is like, like a charge port, it's trivial. Um, so, um, so yeah, the cars would just automatically park the, and automatically uh, plug in. The, the fundamental really fundamental message that consumers should be taking um, today is that it's financially insane to buy anything other than a Tesla. They will be, uh, it'll be like owning a horse in three years. I mean, fine if you want to own a horse, but you should go into it with that expectation. If, if you buy a car that, it does not, that does not have the hardware necessary for full self-driving, it is like buying a horse. 